So, um, so we're going to do just a classic sort of secular funeral plan. I think that, you know, probably all of us have been to a funeral or two, but we might not have had to organize it. And then if someone dies, that can be a real kind of pressure, adding stress to stress. So if we've walked through it once, then, it, then the next time you have to plan a funeral, it's not going to be a big deal because you know where to look and kind of how to play with it. So um, for those of you that have had to organize funerals, um, jump in with any extra ideas or things that you've seen that you think are really lovely. And uh, we'll just kind of collaborate with this part. So this is the classic um, secular funeral or um, you know, semi-Judeo-Christian Western kind of a funeral structure. And please, if you're in charge of the funeral, rearrange it how you like. But if you just kind of have these main pieces in the back of your mind, it can kind of settle you down. So when people come in, a little bit of music in the background can help them relax. If it's totally silent, there can be that kind of tension and awkwardness. Also, if it's silent and people are getting seated, then they might start talking to each other, which is fine, but it's, it's hard to kind of um, give them the idea now we're moving into the funeral. You know, you don't want people to be talking and bonding and then you have to like, you know, yell over the PA, okay, we're starting now. <laughs> you know, if you have the music going, you can fade it down right before you start and then people naturally quiet down and it's a bit more smooth and less clunky. So, um, you know, for opening music, I would recommend something without lyrics, um, probably no ACDC unless that's how they roll, right? But for opening music, something sweet and simple and without lyrics, um, something classical or, you know, some other kind of pretty thing that you think they would have liked. Then you've got the introduction and the opening remarks. So this is by the celebrant or the MC. You might be the celebrant or the MC, or you might be the one that is hiring them. Um, if you're the either of these cases, it's worth checking in what's actually going to be said. Have it written down. Even if you're really good at improv or the celebrant is someone you trust, it's, it's worth looking it over together before the funeral. So, you know, these opening remarks, they can be... Um, they can be a little bit embarrassing if they're from a celebrant who didn't know the person who died. You know, they can say some sort of grand sweeping statement about God's plan and they're an atheist or a Buddhist, you know? So, so kind of check in with the celebrant, like what are your opening remarks? And if you're the celebrant um, or the MC, even if you know in general what you're gonna talk about, write it down because the nerves I, I tell you, even when I have to be the celebrant for a funeral of someone I've never met, still all of the grief and all of the emotion in the room, you just blank. You totally blank. So if you have written down really big, you know, 16 point font, big spaces in between, what are you going to say? You can throw it out the window if you need to, but if you get really nervous, it'll help anchor you. So write it down. And um, if someone else is doing it, ask them what they plan to say, because they might go on to some whole random tangent um, related to a belief system that's nobody in the rooms except for the celebrant. Also, I found pronouncing names is important. Um, yeah. Nothing worse yeah. when they say the names incorrectly. Um, Absolutely. Things. And then everyone cringes or gets tense every time. Yeah. Yeah. Names. Um, I think, you know, even if you give the celebrant a couple lines of their belief system was this, um, or their belief system was definitely not this, <laughs> um, you know, if, they're t if their spouse is there, it could be that they had a great marriage, or it could be that they had a horrible marriage, you know, and you don't want the MC to just assume their loving husband, their loving wife, if that was not really the case, and then everyone in the room knows that wasn't the case, but the MC is just trying to do a nice thing, but everyone else is kind of cringing, because it was like, nah. <laughs> you know. So, so do check in with them because they often have just a script that they always use and it's not always suitable. <laughs> um, so then you get like the first reading or the second reading. These readings, um, these can be really nice um, things for you to organize yourself. So these can be like a prayer or a poem or an inspirational reading or something that's personal. And 
It could be the sort of thing that is done by the celebrant, but you hand it to them beforehand, or members of the family can come up and read them, or um, clergy members. So often in a funeral, there's um, one or two readings from um, you know, a novel, a poem, a song, a prayer um, that someone likes. Often uh, someone who is not Buddhist, but their family is Buddhist, or they have a Buddhist family member will ask a monk or a nun to just read one or two prayers. And then maybe a priest or a rabbi read one or two prayers, but it's not like the bulk of the funeral. You know, it's just something that is going to help the people in the room have a positive mind and isn't something that would be offensive to the person who's deceased. So it can be, um, if you're the Buddhist person organizing a non-Buddhist funeral, you can slide in a little friendly Buddhist prayer like Shanti Deva that's kind of accessible. Those one or two readings or lots of readings, you know, just rock on. Assume that one page takes a minimum a minute to read, but probably more like five minutes if it's read in a kind of nice, uh, easy to understand pace. So if you have tons of readings, it could wind up getting a bit labored and people can start to drift and the meaning is lost. So just kind of time it as well. Um, here's an example, and this one is in your course materials, which is, um, it's semi-secular. So it's Death by Khalil Gibran from The Prophet. Some of you guys know it. Um, and it says, we would now ask of death. And he said, you would know the secret of death, but how shall you find it unless you seek it in the heart of life? The owl whose night-bound eyes are blind unto the day, cannot unveil the mystery of light. If you would indeed behold the spirit of death, open your heart wide unto the body of life. For life and death are one, even as the river and sea are one. In the depths of your hopes and desires lies your silent knowledge of the beyond. And like seeds dreaming beneath the snow, your heart dreams of spring. Trust the dreams for in them is hidden the gate to eternity. Your fear of death is but the trembling of the shepherd when he stands before the king whose hand is to be laid upon him in honor. Is the shepherd not joyful beneath his trembling that he shall wear the mark of the king? Yet is he not more mindful of his trembling? For what is it to die but to stand naked in the wind and to melt into the sun? And what is it to cease breathing but to free the breath from its restless tides, that it might rise up and expand and seek God or the transcendence or love or the divine unencumbered. Only when you drink from the river of silence shall you indeed sing. And when you have reached the mountain top, then you shall begin to climb. And when the earth shall claim your limbs, then shall you truly dance. So, you know, there's plenty of beautiful stuff out there that's spiritual, but it's not specific to a religion that is relatively secular. And if there's a word like God in it, and that's going to be triggering, you can adjust it and say the divine or transcendence or love. You know, you can just, you know, tweak it so that it works for your group of people. But, um, you know, these readings, I think they can get people into an atmosphere where they are also opening to some sort of transcendence. You know, the, the funeral is like a gift that you're offering the people who are grieving as much as something that is celebrating the life of the person who died. So to kind of think of it from both perspectives of um, if you can offer ways to soothe all the family members and loved ones and colleagues, um, I think it can be a really beautiful thing. And if you're the one who has to read, thinking in those terms will help you not be so caught in your own emotion because you're thinking, how can I support them in their grief? Um, so that reading section, um, have people heard or seen other, um, other versions of that in funerals that you thought were really beautiful? I, I have. Um... I can't remember them. I've got them in a little box. <laughs> so I remember circling and thinking, I'll use that one day. <laughs> yeah. Because it was so beautiful. Um, just just some words. Uh, it was old poetry or so. Mm. Yes. Yeah. It was the typical things by Rumi. Like really, yeah. really 
very, they're very short and, and I was actually, because I've been thinking about this stuff because of the condition my parents are in at the moment. But the other thing is too, my, my entire family, I mean, one of my sisters is a little bit new age, but not sort of very far into that, are completely materialistic. Like completely, yeah. because, you know, they're very wealthy and they're kind of like a bit of the God realm in some respects, you know. And so they, any, like, anything like that would just, it's completely enough and, and they, they, would, they would reject it. It would just, they just say, no, you stupid girl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and sometimes during the readings time, you know, you can break it up with like a family member who is always the life of the party, the clown one, you know, to like, okay, now that we've done something serious and Buddhist, we're going to ask, you know, Uncle Sam to come up here and tell the funny story about that one time, you know, and that way, then the people who are thinking it's getting too precious and religious will have a kind of a moment of tension relief because, you know, there's some sort of guy mucking about telling silly stories and you can kind of you know, think about the pacing in terms of light and shade, of intense and expansive, of, you know, kind of humorous and somber, and just kind of think about the pacing a little bit. Um, because, yeah, there are, there often is the case of someone who's going to have a big eye roll <laughs> at your spiritual invitation. Um, you know, I was thinking about like my folks, um, you know, they were Christian, are Christian-ish, but honestly, their religion is like the Moody Blues, <laughs> right? So I'm just gonna like read lyrics from their favorite songs, not Nights in White Satin, but one of the more spiritual ones, you know? So I'll look through the catalog of Moody Blues songs and I'll find some, you know, some sort of beautiful one and that's what I'll read because I know that's what they love. Um, I might read the Lord's Prayer because they love the Lord's Prayer, but other than that, you know, it's like, I know that they have a distance from that, so I'm not going to suddenly try to revive their Christianity when it's obvious that they've kind of moved away from it, you know, so just kind of thinking in those terms, um, if there's no poetry or literature that's immediately making you think of them, um, think of the songs that they love or the artists that they love and, and just read out the lyrics, you know. Um, so there's lots of lots of ways to approach this. Um, it can be quite a fun thing to do, you know, what's something that is going to remind every one of them. Um, so then you get the like the classics, right? You get the eulogy and sometimes the second eulogy. The main eulogy is usually done by like their spouse or their best friend or someone who is really close to them or a clergy member. So like the main eulogy is basically kind of the story of their life, um, the highlights, you know, you don't want to ramble on, but kind of like a solid five minutes of the highlights of this person's life. And then the second eulogy might be done by like a colleague or a more distant friend from another aspect of that deceased person's life. So it kind of gives another angle on the person that maybe their family didn't really know about, or maybe their work people didn't know about. So a second eulogy is totally optional, but it can be fun to like bring in a whole different element of storytelling about the person. And then, um, you know, when you have kind of one or two formal eulogies, then you can kind of invite people if they want to come up and speak. Um, it can be spontaneous or it can be planned beforehand um, where people share like brief memories or stories. Um, and I guess, just something to think about with that is, do you have any loose cannons in your family or any loose can cannons in the circle of friends that if you make an open invitation, is it also an invitation for some chaos and some drama? If that's the case, give, the, give people a bit of a shoulder tap ahead of time and say, at this point, you know, about 20 minutes in or whatever, I'm going to open it up for people to share and, um, and I'll call on you one by one if you feel comfortable sharing. You don't have to tell me the story or anything like that. It doesn't have to be too planned, but would you feel comfortable talking for a minute or two minutes about the person who's died? So you consciously have picked them out ahead of time. And it might be that it is a little spontaneous in the sense of it's as people are gathering and when people are sitting down but um just kind of think about your own family situation if if to leave it completely spontaneous if there'll be an awkward tense pause or there'll be people who uh like drama and invite drama who are kind of come up and like stir the pot because you know now's not the time yeah so a bit of stories 
Um, if you've planned it ahead of time, it's good to kind of alternate somber story with funny story, you know, profound story with light story, kind of alternate and, you know, just kind of for the sake of everybody's listening experience. And then um, a quiet reflection with music often comes towards this point where people have kind of heard enough, um, even if it was profound and meaningful and good stuff. Now it's a nice time to have some quiet reflection. And here's where nowadays people do like a photo montage projected onto a screen, sometimes with music, um, sometimes with maybe an audio message that was recorded by the deceased before they died. Um, you know, things like that. So, you know, if it feels comfortable, if it feels like that's what the person would like, it, this could be the time where people go up and like place a flower on the coffin while the music is playing, or you could kind of break that into two separate things. Yeah, so there could be just a photo montage with music, or there could be photo montage music flower placing, or um, sometimes people um, have like homemade coffins that are kind of rough wood and people can paint messages on the wood or leave little notes inside the coffin. You know, there's all sorts of kind of creative things that people do, but it's kind of nice to, if you're going to do a quiet reflection time that has group participation, to, to have it a little ways into the funeral. Because if you do it right off the bat, people haven't quite settled and it's a bit tense and awkward. So you want them to kind of like, settle into the experience and to connect with the whole process before you ask them to stand up. And then if you're remembering kind of, it's hard for adults to stay focused for more than about 20 minutes um, to kind of shift gears every kind of 20 minutes. I, I would really recommend against having a funeral that goes two hours or more, you know, cause that really, even if people are into it, it can be really draining for folks. Um, so um, quiet reflection time is a nice thing to build in. Then there's some further marks, remarks by the celebrant, um, you know, just kind of some closing remarks about the person's life. And this might include the committal. So this might be something that happens out of the um, chapel, you know, room, wherever you're having the funeral. This might happen at the grave side, um, or it could happen in the room itself. So um, you want to kind of time that. Is there going to be a graveside thing or is there going to be an ashes spreading thing or a tree planting thing? Um, have a little plan of what you'd say if that's the case. But for a lot of people, um, they kind of wrap it up at the actual chapel where the coffin is or where the ashes are. And there's a closing kind of music and final thoughts as people leave. So these kind of uh, ending things, just kind of think how, how, how do you want to end it? Um, to not kind of leave it open-ended where um, it's kind of like abruptly finished. Like, okay, people have said what they want to say. The montage is done. Okay, bye. You know, make sure that there's some kind of anchoring, wrapping up statement about, you know, the profundity and the meaning of their life or the meaning of life in general or some, again, poem or prayer that they would have responded well to. And, um, and then to indicate it's okay to get up and leave, <laughs> gradually turn the music back on, the instrumental music that's soothing. Um, you know, <laughs> Children was telling me that there was a funeral she was at recently where they had asked um, to play um, Highway to Hell as they left with the coffin, you know, because he was that kind of a guy. So it could be, you know, something that's a bit like not what you'd expect that actually makes people laugh and break the tension. Um, but again, it just has to be really specific um, to the individual. And if it's your funeral, you know, think about kind of what you want to be the send off. So that's a secular funeral. Lots of people have refreshments and stuff after. Sometimes um, it will be before. So those kind of additional things you can organize if it seems reasonable. But um, do you have any questions about a secular funeral before we do a Buddhist funeral? Um, I suppose I do. I'm just thinking of my grandmother's funeral, where, um, which of course involved this complex family of mine. I guess we all have complex families, but um, I mean, she was uh, she was pretty old. She's about 98 when she died, and so for her, I would have thought that we should have done something that was in the Church of England and had that real ritualistic thing to hold it. You know, yeah. But that wasn't what happened. So there was nothing to hold the people at the crematorium. Do you know what I mean? And so yeah. 
lead family people came. It's a big family. It's a very Australian family. It's a long history. And um, yeah, I just wonder if you want to comment about that. I mean, it was almost like a funeral that wasn't, that kind of went wrong. Nobody really thought yeah. what was needed for the people who were there. I guess it's it's kind of a matter of trust yourself. If you know the funeral is lacking something and you're at all involved in the planning process, you know, speak up. But if it's one of those things where you weren't involved with it at all and you're just, you know, one of the family members rocking up and you're like, this is not quite going well or this isn't quite got the right tone to kind of, you know, go over to the MC or whoever's in charge and say, would it be okay if I said a few words about or is there someone here who can dot, 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 you know, not to kind of be pushy and take over, but to kind of go to whoever is in charge and say, you know, I know that they had a strong connection with Church of England, blah, 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 Church of England prayer would be really great right now. Does somebody have that? You know, and if you have, you know, a little stash of, I know my family and my family is not well organized, I'm going to bring a little ream of <laughs> possible prayers. And just in case, I'm going to have them. Um, you know, with my granddad's funeral, we knew he wasn't super um, religious, but we did have the Masons do their little Mason thing. Um, and then we had a Methodist minister who was really um, expansive and um, heart-centered and not too, you know, fire and brimstone. Just read a few nice passages that we knew he would have liked, and we just kind of bookended it, but mostly it was just stories about why he's great. You know, but we did bookend it with something a little bit religious. So um, I think that does help it feel held. So it's a question of whether or not you're involved with the planning process or not, and kind of trusting yourself if you feel that gut feeling of, oh, this isn't quite held together. Can we add some things to give it some weight and some depth? Um, you know, while acknowledging that people are going to be all full of grief and their emotions are going to be right on the surface and the potential for family drama is huge. And to just keep that hold steady, hold steady, I can break down after 49 days. But right now I'm just going to keep holding steady and, um, you know, bring my best self to my family for the sake of my family and the one who's died. So I'll be assertive, but if there's reaction to it, I'll let it go. But yeah, I think trust yourself. Yeah, and bring some bring some spare prayers under your under your arm if you know your family's that kind of family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyone else have thoughts about that though? Because it's I think it is quite a common thing, um, especially in rural communities or maybe Australian communities where it's kind of loosely held together, not totally thought out. Um, should be right, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And then people are left feeling a bit disappointed. Yeah, or a bit sort of unsatisfied. Yeah, in it. Oh, sorry, everyone. Good morning. Can I just ask, is there any context or, or in Buddhism if you don't have a funeral? I know there's the legal side where you've got to be that, but if you don't have an open ceremony and everything that you, you go through, is that any way part of our rebirth or is the ceremony here is more for those left behind? Yeah, this is just really a, a secular perspective um, because despite us being Buddhist, probably the people that we're gonna look after aren't. And so if we know a general framework to offer them, it's one more thing that, that can put their mind at ease. And it's also one more thing that can help the bardo being have some sense of being soothed because they have a mild clairvoyance and they might be hanging around their loved ones mm -hmm. right after they've left the body. So if there's beautiful celebrations of life that might soothe them and make them happy, it isn't necessary. It's really not. It's, it is often for the people who are left behind. It's just more about creating that really positive atmosphere to bring out the best in the person who's transitioning. And then from a Buddhist perspective, we'll go on to that in a sec, um, which is a lot less, um, I guess it's, it's a lot less in need of let's be super formal about it. You know, it can be a lot more about your own personal practice related to that person who's passed. Um, but there's kind of some westernized hybrids of common Western funeral with Buddhist practices that a lot of folks do. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So any, yeah, any other questions about kind of the secular way to approach it before we do the Buddhist way? Or cool ideas that you've seen? 
I think that um, just remembering that, um, yes, it, it, um, the, f the family dramas will often come out and um, we just have to do our best as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I um, was told by my siblings not to speak at my mum's funeral, but I did. Um, but I guess, yeah, you, you could analyse for ages about should you or shouldn't you, but the family kind of goes on a bit with the dramas. Yeah, and you know, there, there's an argument to sort of take one for the team and put your own needs to the back burner and deal with them later. And there's also an argument that your needs are just as valid as everyone else's and there should be a collaboration and a conversation about how to celebrate a life or how to work with grief. And I think we just have to look at our own practice kind of where we're at with that. Um, because sometimes we'll squash our needs under the heading of thinking that we are fine, we're fine, we're fine, this is for them, this is for them. But actually, if we had spoken up and been assertive, um, it would have really helped our grief process and they could have coped with it. So it was a fair enough thing to ask, you know? So you just have to take it case by case. But um, the peaceful atmosphere, that is the huge thing that we wanna really keep coming back to both as the person is dying and when they're in the bardo. And they're in the Bardo, you know, up to 49 days. And so for that 49 days, drama minimizing is really your job, you know, and is kind of your project, at least internally. You know, some, sometimes there's nothing you can do about the crazy family. But if internally you're really reconnecting with your refuge and reconnecting with peace, at least you're not um, another part of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Just gently. Yeah. So, um, so we'll do the Buddhist way and then we'll have a little tea break. And the Buddhist way is um, pretty straightforward and a lot of you would guess. So the Buddhist funeral, this is like a suggested kind of westernized hybrid. Um, if you were a Tibetan Tibetan, you know, ethnically Tibetan as well as Tibetan Buddhist, it would be a lot less song and dance and a lot more just do practice, just do practice. Um, we're used to a certain set of things kind of culturally, I think that can um, be brought in. Um, sometimes when Westerners have tried to do straight Buddhist practice without all the other smells and bells and frills, um, a lot of the non-Buddhist family members feel neglected or feel unresolved. Um, and even we might just because we're so used to a certain kind of setup. So um, a hybrid can be useful, but again, change and adjust it any way you like. So if people are coming to a gompa, it's really useful if there's a welcoming person to greet people, to hand out the ritual texts, and to explain seating and answer questions. Because um, if it's a Buddhist person who's died or it's a Buddhist ceremony of some kind, there's usually gonna be tons of friends and family that have no idea what's going on, but are up for it. You know, Cause they loved them and they knew that this was their thing. So they wanna do the right thing, but they're gonna feel awkward and they're gonna feel out of their depth and this isn't their territory. So if there's someone who can welcome them and say, we're going to do some chanting, we're going to read out of this book, you can sit on a chair, you can sit on a cushion, um, you know, let me know if you have any questions, try not to put text on the ground, you know, that kind of thing. If you got a really friendly, grounded person who can take on the welcoming job, it really helps. Yeah. And then before the puja or the ceremony, this is the kind of more westernized way, have an introduction and opening remarks by the lama or monk or nun or lay senior student who's kind of holding the practice. This might be the umze. So um, normally in a puja, we just say, remember bodhicitta? Off we go, <laughs> right? And we just launch right into it. If it's a funeral celebration situation, you wanna frame it and say, we're here today because so-and-so has passed away and is in the bardo. This practice is to help remind them of their practice so that they stay centered and focused throughout the bardo experience so that their next rebirth helps them continue their spiritual path. So think that we're saying this practice to them, that we're helping hold them through this time, which can be very confusing and difficult. You know, framing it, it doesn't even have to be long. It can be like two minutes, but it's basically 
to your non-Buddhist friends and family, what on earth is going on and why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's less for the dying person and more for the people at the practice. But if the people at the practice feel more of a connection to the practice, that's more minds doing the practice, which is more useful for the person in the bardo. So it's like initially it's it's just to kind of settle people and get them oriented, but it actually helps everybody connect a lot deeper, even if it's not their practice. You know, think about the Guru Puja. There's tons of it that makes no sense without any context, but like the Lamrim prayer is totally accessible and beautiful. And there's so many parts that even if you'd never heard it before and you weren't Buddhist, you would think, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. You know, so give people a chance to connect with the practice. Um, the welcoming person or the introduction person could say things like, um, if you feel like you understand the chanting in the tomb, you're very welcome to join in. If you feel awkward or it doesn't resonate with you, feel free to just connect with compassion or you know, read your own prayers under your breath or you, know, you just kind of invite some flexibility into the situation because uh, we've probably all experienced a Buddhist practice where lots of people didn't know what they were doing. And so it was tense. Yeah, you know, that feeling where it's like, you know, some people kind of knew, some people knew more, some people didn't know anything, but were up for it. And it was just a bit tense because no one was really sure. Whatever you can do to kind of um, invite flexibility and kind of remind people that the main point is compassion and love. And the main point is to kind of give them a good send off that's going to help them connect to their path. Yeah. Does that make sense? That kind of like welcoming intro bit. If you're having a Buddhist practice for folks um, instead of a regular Western secular thing. Yeah. So, you know, again, have it written down, you know, have a script because you'll be nervous and it's, you know, it's a little bit awkward. Okay, so um, the classic Buddhist prayers in our tradition to do for someone who's passed away is Guru Puja Lama Chopa. Guru Puja Lama Chopa is, you know, it's something that needs someone who is a confident chant leader. If you don't have a confident chant leader, it's really awkward <laughs> for people to listen to someone who doesn't know what they're doing. Um, if ever there was a time to be guided by someone with confidence, it would be something like this where there's a lot of volatile emotions. So if there isn't someone like that, don't worry about it. Just do Medicine Buddha instead, because you can do it in English, because the prayers are nice and accessible. And what's more, Medicine Buddha is for people who have died as well. So it's a good practice to do for people anyway, um, you know, or something that's their favorite practice. Does that make sense? So like, in theory, you would just do Guru Puja with a huge sog, and the huge sog would be dedicated on behalf of the person who died. So as many beautiful offerings as you possibly could, really gloriously, beautifully laid out. But, you know, if no one's there to lead it, um, don't stress yourself out trying to organize something you don't understand. Just switch to something you do understand, like Medicine Buddha Puja. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah or practice that they love. It's okay to use a recording as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah Jonathan, could you do both? Could you do the secular one for family and everyone, and then do the second one, the Buddhist one, for all your Buddhist friends and all that? Or which one should come first, if they are a Buddhist practitioner? Which one would you do the Buddhist practice first and then invite the family to, the, to a funeral? What way could you do it? Yeah, I think you just got to take it case by case. Um, okay. Yeah, and, and often people do do both um, or incorporate both. Um, most of the semi-Buddhist funerals that, that I've helped out with through um, Karuna Hospice, those ones, it's usually if the person was Buddhist, but the family is not Buddhist, we do the secular format, but during the readings, we just do tons of Buddhist prayers, not tons, but like, I don't know, five or something, as opposed to a puja because they're not going to get a puja or connect to a puja. So we'll do like the bardo prayer. And um, there's a whole bunch of bardo prayers in your um, reading materials. And so some of those work really well as kind of a instead of situation. For people that are really hardcore Buddhist and you're friends with them, I think there is an argument to do just a separate thing that's just for their Buddhist friends. But also remember that sometimes people like being a part of people's life and practice. 
you know, so even if the family members weren't Buddhist, if someone is Buddhist enough <laughs> to like a guru puja at the end of their life, then their family knows that they're Buddhist and they might actually be kind of curious and want to be a part of it. And so if you can have kind of an open invitational atmosphere that's saying, even if you don't understand, you're welcome. It's good imprints for them and it helps them feel included. So whatever you can do to make the friends and family feel included in the process and you know best if it's going to freak them out and you should just separate it into two separate events. Yeah. So yeah, take it case by case. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Guru Puja and Medicine Buddha, I would do one or the other um, because Guru Puja takes two hours and Medicine Buddha takes solid hour. And if people are there for hours and hours, they're going to start getting grumpy and lose focus. So <laughs> either or. But a nice thing to tack on to the end of a puja is a light offering ceremony with an opportunity for people to speak as they light the candles. So this is a really nice hybrid practice where basically you have a big table with a bunch of tea lights and someone who feels confident comes up and says, you know, may you find peace in the next life that you weren't able to connect with in this life, or may you meet, you know, a spiritual path or whatever sort of aspirations. They might say it out loud as they light the candle, or they might just say it silently to the bardo being. But one by one, people go up and light a candle, and then they all sit down again and do the actual light offering ritual. So um, it, this is a nice hybrid because there is the light offering ritual, which is only like three pages long. It's quite a short one, but you're kind of involving everyone and helping them feel connected and able to participate by them each going up one by one and lighting. So um, it's nice to say, you can say out loud or you can say silently to yourself because of course there's people that will feel awkward and not want to talk out loud or will be you know, crying and stuff. But um, adding a light offering ceremony is a nice kind of way to round it out. Yeah. Okay, so that's the kind of bulk of it if you're doing a hybrid. And then you have, you know, final remarks. This might be, um, you know, the burial or a burning ceremony in countries that allow it or a scattering of ashes um, or not, right? It could just be final words and the coffin's not even there. It's just a picture of the person. And then closing the service with a dedication prayer like Shantideva. Um, and then as people leave, having again some sort of um, chanting or music or recording, um, just so people feel now it's okay to go. <laughs> just kind of giving people those auditory cues so that there's less tension and less awkwardness. And then maybe outside the gompa in another space is a gathering for refreshments and storytellings and stuff like that. So that's kind of a hybrid. And so, you know, it might be that you just do the light offering ceremony and then this like simple bardo prayer. So the simple bardo prayer, basically you're just inserting the first name of the person everywhere there's blanks. And the bardo prayer comes from the Tibetan Book of the Dead uh, revealed by Guru Padmasambhava. And it's beautiful and accessible. And even if you're not Buddhist, um, it's easy to connect to. So if you are putting this into a secular funeral or you're tacking it at the end of a Buddhist funeral, this one's a really good one to have up your sleeve. This is also a really good one to use during the bardo of the person. So you could recite it every day or recite it every seven days, but this is kind of a good go-to prayer um, to support someone through their transition. So it goes, O oh, enlightened beings and holy beings, abiding in all directions, endowed with great compassion, endowed with foreknowledge, endowed with divine eye, endowed with love, affording protection to all sentient beings, please, through the power of your great compassion, come forth. O oh, compassionate ones, you who possess the wisdom of understanding, the love of compassion, the power of doing divine deeds and of protecting an incomprehensible measure. This person is passing from this world to the next. They are taking a great leap. The light of the world is faded for them. They have entered solitude with their karmic forces. They have gone into a vast silence. They are borne away by the great ocean of birth and death. O oh, compassionate ones, protect them who are defenseless. 
be to them like kind parents. O compassionate ones, let not the force of your compassion be weak, but aid them. Let them not go into a suffering state of existence. Forget not your ancient vows. So that's, um, that's one to plug into any kind of Buddhist related funeral, but also that's just your go-to prayer to use um, during the bardo of someone who's passed away. So whether it's a daily thing or it's an every seven days thing, um, that's your classic. So any questions about the hybrid? Venerable, normally the uh, crematoriums only allow a certain amount of time. But I guess um, usually yeah. they've got them all queued up, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and it's normally difficult because they're trying to move people on. Um, is it appropriate to have the ceremony, say, after the crematorium? So after you've, your ashes, for instance, your picture, and then you could have it somewhere else? So you can have the hybrid ceremony there. Excellent. Yeah, or before. Yeah, maybe before and then end it with the with the cremation. Uh, you know, during the cremation, however many people are um, in the room, you could lead them through something really simple, like just Omani Pemehun. You know, you could lead them through like just the Shanti Deva prayer. So if it's one of those things where you only have, you know, half an hour or however long, you can really do an abbreviated kind of intensified one and then do a more kind of expansive version later after people have had a cup of tea and a stretch and, you know, are kind of ready for round two, or you could start it that way. So yeah, that's a, it's a good point because certainly they like to move you on. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I find yeah. that very difficult. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And also with hospitals, right? You know, you want to be able to leave them for at least a day for three days so that their um, consciousness has time to kind of enjoy the peace of the clear light, even if they're not able to use the clear light. But of course, they want the hospital beds and they want to move them on. So, you know, it, it's worth talking to, you know, the, the people at nursing homes or the people in the hospice and, and say, um, I'm a Buddhist and I would, and due to our beliefs, we would like um, the body to remain undisturbed for as long as possible. How long do you think is possible? And sometimes they'll say, actually, we're okay for this week. You can just, you know, leave them and um, let us know when you're ready. And you know that the consciousness has left the body when there's no longer any warmth whatsoever at the heart center. And often a little drop comes from their nostril. So, um, or if rigor mortis sets in, then obviously they've left. But if the body is still fresh seeming, despite medical death, if you can leave it alone, that's lovely. But similar to the crematorium situation, sometimes they just want the bed and they move them on. And so, you know, tap the top of their head to encourage the consciousness to leave there, um, say some mantras and let go of what you would prefer to be the case and just kind of accept what is the case. Try not to get, um, you know, angry <laughs> at the staff. Yeah, like that. So we'll have a little um, cup of tea and then we'll do some question and answer and, and move into some other stuff.